man. So you got shot six times. Yes. And we didn't ask what happened during that event. So yeah. I, I was sitting there thinking about that a lot. And it, it had to be something extraordinary to go from being shot six times yeah. to picking yourself up and going from where you were. So just expound on that journey as much as you can from being shot and then picking yourself up in the events that transpired just from that event on. No problem, man. And I, yeah, I read a few of the comments. People were saying, well, you must have got shot for some reason or something, something happened or you must have been doing this. Y um, you know, and that's funny because that's what the police officers came and asked me when I was laying there and I couldn't breathe and blood was coming out of my mouth and I was just in that struggling situation. But no, actually it was a random event. You know, I was on my way to cut Method Man from Wu-Tang Clan. You know, uh, fortunately I never got involved in gangs. You know, I never sold drugs. Um, it's, um, that doesn't make me any better than anyone else because that doesn't make me immune to being shot, but I didn't live the lifestyle of beefing with nobody. I had no beef. I had no problems with anyone in the streets. Not that I know of, you know, I didn't take anything from anyone. I was just a man running a barbershop on Crenshaw Boulevard in Los Angeles. And I was at the wrong place at the wrong time. And that can happen to any of us. You know, it's like a car accident. You can be stopped at the light and somebody rear end you. You know what I'm saying? And, and that things happen, you know? And so in that situation, I, uh, it was a Hispanic guy. He came out. I was on the phone. Ironically, I was on the phone complaining about where I was staying at the time. And the guy came over and he put the gun in my face. When he put the gun in my face, of course, naturally the phone dropped, everything dropped. I was going in my gate. I heard someone say, hold up. Then I saw the gun. When I looked over and saw the gun, I hit him with the gate and I started running and he shot me shot me in the back first and he shot me on the other side he was a pretty damn good shot he shot me he was hitting me he hit me six times um and then what happened was the last bullet hit me in my leg and i fell face forward into the ground and then he ran up and put the gun close to my uh, temple because i felt the barrel it was still hot uh by my face and uh he pulled the trigger and, it, and he pulled it three times click 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 and when he pulled the trigger you know um, I thought that was it, but he ran off. The cops came up, harassed me in that situation. I, uh, just so happened I got shot in the Rampart division. You know about Rampart back in the day. That's connected to the Rodney King situation. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it was a Hispanic cop and a white cop. Not that their race had anything to do with this, but you know we know that pigs come in different forms and different colors. Yeah. And so he walked up to me and asked me what I did to deserve this. That was the first thing he asked me. Um, I couldn't breathe, so I couldn't really talk. And I said, nothing. Please help me. Please help me. He said, oh, you must have did something to deserve this. And then the white cop asked me my name standing over me. He said, what's your name? I said, Kia, please help me. Kia, please help me. I couldn't. Again, I couldn't breathe, so I couldn't really talk. And when I told him my name as much as I could, he said, I can't understand you. Um, if you don't tell us your name, we can't get you any help. At that moment, I heard ambulances coming already because someone in the building complex, they called uh, 911 and said that, that, that uh, I needed an ambulance. Um, I got an ambulance and they were unattentive, you know, because you have a lot of people that work these jobs and they, they're not doing what they really love to do. You know, I understand people are trying to get that check, but they had me in there. I had to hold myself on the gurney. I had to uh, I kept asking them to put the mask on my face because I couldn't breathe. What? Um, yeah, it was it was it was one it was one hell of an experience. And then some of the nurses was assholes. Damn near putting their thumb in my bullet wound to flip me over to change my bandages. And you know, it was it was uh it was a very humbling experience. I turned into a different person in the in the fold of that because I got a chance to really see and understand that, you know, you have you have to be, you know you really truly have to be of a certain mindset in order to get somewhere in life. And you got these people in there, they, they, they don't want to be there and they shouldn't be there because, and then there were some great nurses and some great doctors and people that really had love, but off the back, they was looking at me like I was a game banger. You know what I'm saying? I'm six foot two, you know what I'm saying? 285 pounds. So they looking at me like, Oh, this dude had to be, had to do, had to have done something to someone that he's a game banger and not at all. Not at all. I just that's not my lifestyle. That's not my approach, you know. And so I got depicted as a Suge Knight character, and they didn't even know who I was. They didn't. They didn't know about my little son waiting on me to get home. You right. know, they didn't know about my little daughters waiting on daddy to come home. 
and they just just didn't understand, you know, and that's the problem with in in connection to a guy like Folkmaster Flex, who is uh, used for these radio stations to play all this violent music and all this negativity that people overseas and people all over the world because they hear black men saying these different things and doing these different things, they look at all of us as heathens. They look at all of us as gangbangers. You know what I'm saying? Because this is what is presented to the world stage in representation of other black people. And so if this is what's presented, think about it. That's why they looked at me that way. That's why that cop could walk up and ask me what I did to deserve this because I'm a guy, a black guy in the hood. And, you know, I had a white T-shirt on, but a white T-shirt doesn't make you a gangster. I could have had a button up on, you know, and no one deserves and no one deserves to get treated like that. No one deserves to get shot and, 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 and gunned down. No one deserves that. That's a transgression that breaks the law. You've taken that person's right to live or taken that person's right to feel good in their body temple. And that's a transgression. That's what I want to get people back in, uh, back involved with is understanding natural law, universal law, and understanding what a transgression is. And that's my mission as long as I'm here. You in, in, in a situation like that, that, that would turn somebody very dark to deal with what you had to deal with like after that. But it seems like, and I, I don't know you very well, but in the various interviews and various conferences, conversations that we had, it seems like your light has shined the most since that event. That being said, was it the, your core principles that kept you even alive as well as obviously your family? Or did you gain those core principles and to get cult lineage and things like that after that event? Well, what was going on in your brain and in your body to keep you alive when everyone wanted you gone? Mm. That was, that's a great question. I've never been asked that question. And um, I have the answer for that question is that, you know, I definitely was studying heavy beforehand, but those changes came after the fact. I remember the day I was out of the hospital and I, I actually went by my shop. I went home, got dressed. I went by the shop. I was on a, on, on a, a cane because I couldn't really walk on the leg I got shot in. And uh, I remember sitting in front on Crenshaw Boulevard and just feeling the air and feeling the wind. And I just was thinking to myself, like, you know, how is this, how am I going to allow this to affect me? Because at that time, when I first went back to the shop, it was a little tricky for me because I didn't know who was going to walk up on me again with a gun, you know, and uh, I didn't know if I was going to get shot again. So I, there was a little apprehension with being around people at first, but then I let that go because I knew and I understand the principle of fear. And why fear shuts down your connection to the source and your connection to advancement. See, fear is fear. Fear is the number one weapon used in mass mental destruction. Fear is the number one weapon they use for mass mental destruction, especially with our people, especially with people from the culture of hip hop. They use these things. And so I dropped the fear element. And I chose the life element. I dropped the darkness element and moved towards into the light of understanding, you know, because I learned there, too, because it, I felt the feeling of dying and coming back because I blacked out as well. And it was the most peaceful feeling still to this day I've ever had, because while I was laying on the ground, the ants that were crawling through my blood became a part of me. Everything that I was laying on was a part of me. You know, what I'm saying everything that was that that was so-called you know, uh, around me, it felt as if I melted into everything that was around me, but I came back, you know, and I'm, I'm thankful that I was able to uh, come back and be used to, you know, transmit this information for people as much as I can, you know, because it's, it's about, it's about awareness, you know, it's not about, it's not, it's not about just staying ignorant and staying in the dark. It's about becoming aware of certain things and going into the light of consciousness. At your level and your speed. Powerful, man. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, yeah, very, very powerful, man. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm at a loss of words. I it definitely inspired me, you know, hearing that. And I was thinking the same thing you were saying. I could have turned a lot of people, yeah, you know, to the dark side, like going yeah. through all that. Yeah, I um I I, I will admit, like I said, I, I did have there was a fear element the first day, but I had to drop it. But the mo most important thing that I really learned in that position was not taking no day for granted. You know, because I was looking at no more tomorrows laying there. And so I was sarcastically while I was laying there, I was like, damn, this is it. You know, and I had just just dropped my daughter and my son off 
to their mother's house. Um, they wanted to go with me. And but my daughter was looking so bad that day. Her hair was a mess, her shoes, she wasn't dressed right. And it was the weirdest day in the world because they usually are with me on Friday nights. It was a Friday when it happened, the day after my 29th birthday. And uh I dropped them off because I didn't want to take them with me looking that bad, take her with me looking bad like that. And so I got on the phone with her mother and I was trying to chew her mama out, you know, like, damn, why you got her looking bad? You know, she going with me. I got to go cut meth up. And she was like, you know, get off my case. She went off on me, like, you know, how women can do, you know, mm -hmm. saying that she had every right to. And she said, you know, my uh, the, the, the power went out in the building, so my alarm clock didn't go off. So I had to rush and get to work because I already had been late to work. See how see how the source energy worked. It was it was on purpose that I was I, I I dropped my children off because imagine if they was there with me and I'm struggling to live or they might have gotten shot. Yeah. But I dropped them off beforehand, and so this happened on purpose because the purpose that I was willing to do that I put on paper before I got up and went to uh, pick my children up was to do a company called Hip Hop Motivation and bring forth information for people that had been left in the dark on purpose but it was absolutely because i was looking at no more tomorrows that it changed my life forever you know because I, now i live my life since that day to the fullest i don't give a damn if i don't do anything or if i'm just chilling i make sure that i express the love i have for my family members and my friends and you know i just i'm i'm, I'm in so much more peace than i was before i got shot you know i don't take certain things too serious uh even the situation with Dame and them, I, I don't, I'm, I hear it and I see it. I mean, I'm, I'm involved in it in a small way because of the book, but it's not my focus. You know, my focus is to bring forth great information because I know that people need this information. It helps, you know, to learn how to uh, be okay without all the money in the world, you know, because money is not going to make you whole. It's consciousness that makes you whole and makes you better, you know, because you see so many people when they have money, they still kill themselves because they lose a little bit of that money. But if you get into the spirit of yourself and you learn certain things that can that are of value for you, you know, it gives you a better chance to be of value to other people in your community.